Move, 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 move. All right. Oh, shit. <laughs> Damn it. Got to put that link up. I normally play my fight. All right, we're going to have to wait for the intro. Shit, wait for it to load in. No problem. Uh, sorry, but, but what's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? Today is the 128th episode. You know it, and I love it. Of the In Your Face. So, <sighs> hold on, hold on for that thought. Hold that thought. Hold on, just a second. Wait for this thing to load in. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. There you go. What's up? What's up? What's up, everybody? <laughs> Sorry, you know today is the 128th episode of the Air Your Face Show, and I'm here with my main man, Mr. Jeff Carroll. How you day going, brother? It's all good. Now I get to talk some sci-fi and some comic books. Is all that much better? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! You yeah! Oh yeah! Uh, what's good? You know what I'm saying? And the in-your face show is the best way to do it. You know what I mean? Let's get it. Let's get it, brother. Let's get it. So, you know, what was your first, what made you get into the field of comics, man? What made you get into this field, man? Um, comic books was a progression of me just wanting to be a storyteller and tell different types of stories. I, um, started as a low budget filmmaker and the story world that I was telling stories in was limited to the budget that I could afford. So uh, when I, my first film screened at a comic convention way back in 2004 and um, I met an illustrator and I saw the whole world of nerdedom on display. And I was like, you know what? I could tell a whole lot of different stories with the illustrator and my stories. So that's how I got into making comic books. I made my first comic book as a um, uh, a tie-in to my second movie, Gold Digger Killer. And the comic book was Imani the Killer, and I think that's her right here. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So, her, you know, right, right there. how was the transition from comics to, from from films to comics? How, how was that transition? Uh, the writing of it was very much the same. You know, as a screenplay writer, I was already uh, conditioned to tell stories uh, to a, uh, it, almost what is considered a uh, uh, grid, grid, grid or, you know, how, you know, wireframe, how that looks, you know. Mm -hmm. When you had to paint it for a painter, you know, when you're writing a screenplay, you're writing the story for a director, for um, actors, and you're not really sh describing everything for it to be read. So um, for a comic book, you're describing everything for the illustrator to draw. So it's very much the same. Okay, okay. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, yeah. so nah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So comic books are like very close to um, storyboards for movies. So 
the the story transition, you know, is very is sim is easy. You just don't have to worry about um, page turns and um, paneling for a one for a page. But with a storyboard, you're just going from one page to the next. Um, that's very much like manga. So for American comic books, you just have to learn um, page paneling and uh, turning a page. So that's it. That's, it's, it's like seamless. Okay, okay. So what was your proudest accomplishment in the comic field? Oh, my goodness. I'm still... Every last comic that I make is, is like another milestone, a step. The one that I just finished um, doing a Kickstarter for was Planet of the Kibalon. And it was, it is my first full graphic novel story, 100 and something pages. And that was my, that's a, that was a milestone, writing a story that would go on that long. It wasn't just a one shot it was a full graphic novel, volume one, you know, whatever you want to call it. That's what it is. So um, that was a really big one. Um, just doing a comic book in the first place was was really good for me, you know. It made me feel good. Um, doing different genres. I remember when I did Fangonels, my first young adult story, or uh, first all ages, because it's not really young adults, all ages, and then... Um, then I did my adult comic, you know, uh, Cyberfunk Streets. Though so each one of those, you know, was really cool for me. Okay, okay, okay. So, mm, what was your for a proudest accomplishment in in basically filming, you know, the film industry? Um, you know, having your first child is always a significant experience. So, you know, that magic of doing my first film, How If I Kill You, is something that would not be duplicated, you know? Um, I, there's no way to describe seeing your ideas that you wrote, that you thought of, you can remember when you thought of them, and um, seeing them on film, oh my God, that's crazy. So that's a, a one feeling. And then winning your first film award, and that was Gold Digger Killer. So those are two, two firsts, you know, but every film is very much, this, you know, you have the same film, same feeling, getting those ideas out, you know? Right, 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 right. Okay, okay, okay. <sighs> so what do you do when the stress, when you, when you have stress to get done a deadline, you know what I'm saying? Get done some uh, work a job for a deadline, what do you do to, to relieve the stress and the pressure? Um, I always say when I hit a writer's block is to think low, you know, and um, every element of creativity, there's stages. So one stage that's in all of them is in the uh, editing stage in the first draft stage. So nothing that I do is like in my mind going to be what the public sees. So when I write a book or I'm write, creating a story, I allow myself the freedom of knowing that I'll go back and I'll work on it. And my comic books, I do the same thing. So if I think of an idea, a story, I'm writing a story and I hit a, uh, uh, something that I didn't think of before, I'll just think of something easy just to get me past it. I'll think of some Mickey Mouse simple story and then just get me past. And many times that little simple thing works and I don't even have to go back and change it, you know, but I try to think simple. And I find, I guess to me, writer's block or, or creative flow um, stoppages are uh, caused by um, just not being able to think of an idea. And so, um, or you're thinking too much, you're making too much of it. So you try to think less just to allow the story to continue and to get past it. So you can stay on your pace for uh, finishing the story and getting the project out. Mm. Awesome, awesome. 
Whew. What is the biggest challenge you have faced in the field of films and comics? You could do the film first, but you know what I'm saying, if you want to do the comics first, go ahead, you know. Well, I'll say this, the biggest challenge in films, she asked it that way, is, is finances and trying to get stories done within a budget of zero. You know, I do have to pay my illust my actors and I pay for locations, but always, every time I'm working on something, it is what is the cheapest way to get it done? What is the cost of what is going to be so budget? But, you know, I don't think that's an odd thing because I think, you know, almost all projects, even in Hollywood, deal with some form of budgetary constraint, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Even if the director says, ah, I was given freedom to think of whatever. No, you weren't. You didn't think of everything. You, you couldn't use every actor, you know, so you still had some constraints to tell the story within the range of the actors you were given, within the range of the locations you were given, within the range of the special effects that you were able to afford. So, you know, that's, you know, the biggest obstacle there. But as a B-movie filmmaker, a budget filmmaker, I um, approach it from the ground up, from zero up. So um, it's, it's different, I think. And then for comic books, what would be the biggest uh, obstacle? Well, I mean, professionally is getting into catalog and reaching an audience, you know, finding a publisher to get it out or self-publishing. And both of those have their own set of dynamics. Whereas getting books out to distributors and publishers, you know, you, you face rejection, right? And then um, getting them out to the public, it's sort of a s similar thing, but, you know, you believe in your project, that's going to translate to the consumer in ways that doesn't translate to publishers. So um, that's probably it, just getting the word out, trying to reach an audience, getting it to the public by way of comic conventions, the internet, whatever it is. That's the biggest obstacle. Creatively, I don't really have um, obstacles. I mean, there's budget that affects comic books too because I can't afford certain illustrators, you know? I can't afford them. I would love to use them. Sometimes they charge too much, um, but sometimes they're really worth the, the extra amount that you would have to pay. And when I can't afford it, that's a, a sad obstacle. Right. So money. Okay, okay. You know, what's the commerce? Oh, yeah, you, you asked that. <laughs> oh, what is your, what is your most memorable experience? Oh, man. Um, I guess in comic books, it's going to Comic Con, you know. Um, I was nominated for a Lifetime Achievement Award at the first black comic book convention, uh, but I already was booked and I can't afford to fly out and fly back. So I that might be real memorable because I like Ekbok and it was the first black comic convention that I went to, but I'm not able to go. So I'm gonna miss that. And you know, I've I've nominated, but you know, I've I've submitted for Glyph Awards and haven't been able to lock in on it, um, but it's fine. It's the, really the Lifetime Achievement Award that I'm missing out on. Um, damn, I'm trying to think for film. Most memorable probably was winning the Hip Hop Film Festival. You know, um, that set everything in motion. You know, I got presented by the, the award at the Schomburg, incidentally. And um, it was presented by um, uh, Africa Bambata, you know? So you got the one of the founders of hip hop presenting me best feature at a hip hop film festival. That's it, you know, that's a black, you know, that's a that's your credit right there, you, you, you know? Um, so that was memorable. And then I have a whole bunch of other memorable films in film, but if I wanted to say it was one it was winning that award. Man, we were underdogs. 
you know, people like, you know, oh, you only spent this amount of money. The film that you're up against, they spent like 800000 and we beat them. That was wild. And it's a good film, so, it, you know, it should have beat them. But at the end of the day, when it does happen, it's really a good feeling. Mm, mm, mm. You know, you know, how does it feel to be a an established film such as the one that you that you went up against? How did it feel beating them? Yeah. What was the um, feeling like? Well, my friend was one of the producers on it, and um, so I wasn't going in on it like. Yo, I want to kill this. You like when you're making a movie, you don't know what you're gonna be um, going against when when the film is released. You know, um, you barely have an idea when the film is gonna be finished. You know, it's around, so you don't know what else is going on. So it's not like a race, like you know NASCAR. It's not a competition where there are brackets. Like you beat this person, you're going on to the next film. You know, um, that's it's not the NBA. Um, so when you go up against somebody, it feels almost like slam poetry, you know, mm -hmm. you, you happy that the audience is, has selected you to a winner, but you know, the other person is still a poet. So at the end of the day, for me, I'm not one of those fierce competitors where I wish the other person, you know, badness. And I, and I don't let my head get too inflated by the audience choosing my film. I'm happy. I'm loving it. Trust me, I don't get it wrong, but it doesn't make me feel like, oh, I'm the shit or she, I'm, I'm the man and you aren't the man. No, no. I'm just happy to have received an award. Yo, best wishes to you. Let's move on. We are filmmakers. It's good. You know, I appreciate it. But I'm not destroying nobody else because you never know when, you know, your film might win in the East Coast. Their film might win at a horror fest. Their film might win, you know, in the South. Who knows, you know? So it's all subjective. I'm just happy, you know, for myself when a project does win it. But I'm not, like, beating down um, people that I competed against or that I was up against. And so, like, when you see the Grammys, you see these people win awards, they thank their competition, they wish them luck. That's a real feeling because the, the competition wasn't, you know, wasn't a foot race. You didn't, ah, oh, universal win. No, it's just subjective. Subjective. People that lose may sell more than the person that won it. So that's another type of feeling. So you don't really get to universally dominate sometimes. And there's other times where you do, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. True that, true that, true that. You know, it's, it's a lot of things in the, in the, in the, in the um, in comics. It's like that in comics where you, you know, you may be, have a great comic out, right? And then you may have a competition and you don't even know why you have a competition. You're not even trying to compete with nobody, but that's how people are when it comes to you have an, a, a bomb ass project, you know what I'm saying? And you know, and you know you have a bomb ass project, of course Dude. somebody's gonna get competition. You know, you're gonna get a lot of competition. A lot of people wanting to go, come against you. Because that's the way a lot of them a lot of people carry themselves, you know what I mean? Yep. You know, so a lot of the stuff that I learned while in the industry is just keep your keep your head up. You know what I'm saying? Keep going, you know, because a lot of the other stuff that you're doing, you know, you're going up against these big corporations and stuff like that. You're going up against Marvel, DC, you know what I'm saying? Just like in your sense of films, you're going up against films with the big stars. So, you know what I mean? There's a lot of things that's, that comes into play, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. like, it's like, for example, okay, um, one film you may you may um you may beat them at right, but yep. what about your next film? Your next film probably have all of them inside of, in the in the in the in the film. You know, y'all may win together. Yeah, if you're lucky, yeah. that's how it works. Yeah, you know, and you know, like what I learned is never to burn bridges when it comes to 
um, uh, shows when it comes to building something, you know, and not everybody is going to have the right state of mind, mindset, you know what I mean? Rebuild those bridges. You know, not everybody wants to build, rebuild those bridges. But as long as you try to rebuild those bridges, that's fine, you know? Because whether you like it or not, even your enemies will need you sooner or later. Some way, somehow, they need you. It's like your friends or your family. Once you build, once you build that bridge, somebody's gonna need somebody along the way. You know what I'm saying? So I learned a long way to go. You know, I'm still learning patience. I'm still, I'm not perfect. I'm still learning. You know what I'm saying? Just like you are. You know. So I understand what you're talking about, man. Very much. Very much. You know. Like um. How does it feel to be, you know, to have your, what, what did it feel like to get your first book out? Uh, um, I guess, you know, the writing it is really fun, you know, but seeing it in somebody else's hands, I, I think my book at a comic book convention, I think that's very much like other creators, you know, some people do signings and you get a little bit of love before you get thrown out to the general public. But I um, was straight um, to the comic book conventions, you know, so with my books, even with my film, you know, um, my film was different. I had distributors, but for comic books, it was straight to the wolves, straight to people walking past you, straight to people asking about it, people asking more about it than you're ready to share, listen to your speech and say, no, nah, I'm going to move on to the next table. No hard feelings. So it is, it, it's, it's fun. Um, for, I've been blessed that people do like my comics. Um, I, have, I don't have to hard sell. I don't have to make any behind the scenes deals. So it feels great. <laughs> That's like one of the best things I feel like when I get the comic book, I'm ready to, because I crave feedback. I'm a filmmaker. That was my first one. So, you know, first love. Um, so when I go to a film festival, I'm waiting to hear that laughter, that, that, right, first, right. that group response. So the closest thing I can get to it as a comic book creator is comic convention. You know, what's the reaction off the cover, what's the reaction to when I describe it to them? What's the actions, you know, reactions to when I turn pages and they look at different page, you know? So, and then comic book people go to the same comic book every convention every year. So seeing those people come back, I read that book. I'm familiar, you know, like, what did you think about it? I'm ready to hear that, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, see, a lot of that, you know, I've had that with my comic, man, where, you know, a lot of people would like it. A lot of people would like, man, I saw that somewhere. Is that a book from a turn, uh, like a spinoff from the real, the movie Jarhead? I said, no, because uh, it's it's very different. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you saw my, my comic book called Jarhead. I don't know if you saw it a while ago. I don't know. But, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah, you probably did. Somewhere, it's floating around <laughs> somewhere. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people knows about it, you know, when it comes to Jarhead, it comes to like building building those deals, you know what I'm saying? You have to be able to make deals along the way, you know what I'm saying? Because the people that's coming up to your table, you got to be ready for that. Because if you're not ready for those for those table, people coming to your table, they're going to come into your table ready to buy something. And you got to be ready to give that speech, you know what I'm saying? My speech is like this. Hello, how y'all doing? You know what I'm saying? This is the, you know, coming up to the jarhead table. You're going to get your bang for your buck. You're going to get the, the best of the best, you know, what y'all want, what, 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 what y'all looking for today, you know what I'm saying? And they say, uh, I'm looking at your comics, and you know what I'm saying? You got great detail and da 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 So I say, hey, you know, I like what you like. I like that. I like that, you know what I'm saying? And then you make the, if they say they don't have, say, like, $10 to buy your comic. Eh, you make a discount right there in there. I'll give it to you for five. You know what I'm saying? That's how you make a buck. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to always make all your money back at a convention or a place where you're selling it. You're not going to always make your money back. So yeah, at least you make half of your money back, a little bit a little bit of your money back. So at least you don't go, go away empty handed. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I learned. You know, I learned to, you know, I haven't even been to Comic Con, but I've actually 
been able to sell, and I know how to sell. I know how to sell from my job that I had at Bed Bath Beyond. They taught us how to be able to sell, be able to look a person in the eye, be able to speak upright and speak with 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 confidence. And and if you don't know something, pass the buck to somebody who do know something new about it. You know about the product. You know what I'm saying? But be able to eye contact. You know what I'm saying? Be able to talk to people. And be able to small talk. Small talk is a very good trait to have because if you don't have small talk, you make a person laugh, they like you, they like your personality, damn, you got to sell right there. Hit that hit that killer instinct, bang, you got it. Easy, you know what I'm saying? Yep. That's what it's all about most of the time because a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, don't have that. A lot of people are, are afraid to, to talk, you know what I'm saying? And afraid to... To, to I have a, you have a comment and Renee Cooper said, "Hey Jeff, hey, what's good? <laughs> is she, you know, is she a creator? What she do? We'll find out. She's a she's a uh, truck driver. She she's a truck. Uh, she owns a truck company, trucking company. You know, what I'm saying and she does a lot of things. You know, I will have her on a show soon. Okay, to, to talk about show? her." Miss Bill, the famous lady that has the line of trucks that we hear about, Miss Renee Copper. Yeah, Miss <laughs> Renee I Copper. Blow the horn, burn, burn. I tell her she need to do a line of comic books. Tell her, call me up. Let's do some comic books on your trucking company. Travel nurse as well, and there you go. You got a deal, Miss Copper. What's up? Hey, you got you got a deal. You got you got a, you got a deal to make. You know what I'm saying? There you go. Now, um, hey, she's a traveling nurse as well. Okay. Well, I try not to stay sick, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Hey. I mean, I've had nurses do house calls and probably, and, and doctors should too as well. But, you know, not all doctors care about the patient around here. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, they all care about the money, most of them. But it is all right, though. Thank you. It's all about networking. Yes, it is. It's all about network, net, uh, networking because you never know who's watching. You never know who's going to come up and talk to you. You never know who's going to take interest in what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be on your P's and Q's and you got to be always professional, always keeping your, keeping your mind, keeping your eye on the prize because you never know that one person got you. Right. You never know. It could be you could skyrocket to the top just by just by talking to that one person. You know, I mean, you never know. You know, uh, so what did you know as a as a comic creator, right? How was your bringing upbringing getting into comics? How was it? <sighs> um, well, I guess I I have to go back to being a young person. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a picture reader. You know, I was into the fantasy, the aesthetics, right? They always talk about the aesthetics. I was into the images and the imagery, you know. Um, so for me, I got into it because of, you know, wanting to to see different images. Um, and I'm not really even big on character design right now, but, you know, it was the, what the story looked like, what it was about. And then... Later on, as I got older, when I started making comics, I started like you know my my um, love for stories in film overlapped now and replaced my my aesthetical attraction to comics with a more story attraction to comics. So mm -hmm. even now, I am not a big reader of Superman, Spider Man, and all of the Marvel and DC superhero comics. I'm more into the graphic novels. You know, give me Philadelphia, give me Blackula, right? Give me, you know, those type of stories. I enjoy those, you know, the adventure um, uh, uh, type of story. So, yeah, I'm into the graphic novel type stories as superheroes. So, I mean, um, as, 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 as a universe, I like Judge Dredd, you know, that comic book. I'm reading... Um, uh, I read Conan every once in a while. Um, Blade Runner, that's another good one. And then, of course, the black comics, you know, um, that I'm reading. I, re I read Flawed by Chuck Brown. 
Um, independent comics, they always get me. So I'm loving that as well. Right, right. And, you know, see, that, that's, that's what a lot of things in the comic industry, you know, you have a variety of everything, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But when it comes to the big three, you, you don't have a variety. You know what I'm saying? You have, like, the same old, same old shit. You know what I mean? You have to go to, like, Vertigo. Um, well, you know, there's a lot of companies I feel are, like, big, you know, um, because, right. they make, because they make movies and stuff like that. But um, you got Dark Horse, you got Image, you got, you know, a whole bunch. I used to like Radical Comics that made um, Oblivion because they seemed like they all they did was cinematic potential stories, you know? Um, but, yeah, that's what I'm at. I mean, I'm, you, they got me reading. Uh, Jeff, um, uh, uh, John Jennings got me reading um, this new Silver Surfer. And I'm enjoying that. And um, um, what you call it, N.K. Jameson had me reading Green Lantern, her run on Green Lantern. I I was running towards the Black Panther, you know, with Tahashi Coates, Tina Hashi Coates. But, you know, his critique in, of Black people was too much for me to handle. I felt that the, the LGBT agenda was forced and... Um, Destroying Wakanda was too much for me. I do have a romantic relationship with Africa and its people, and um, I don't need it to be destroyed, you know? So that was too much. But I did try Black Panther. My favorite Black Panther one was Black Panther and the Crew, you know? Um, so, you know, that's that was it for me. So I'm down. Right, right, right. You know, um... So when it comes to your first comic, right? When it comes to your first show and what you're doing, do you feel like the comic industry has evolved or dissolved? Like, do you think it went down or up? Well, when I came out my comic, my first comic, it took me a few years to get it done, um, and I got it out in 2007. Actually, right at the time, Gold Digger Killer was um, being released, I'm at Comic-Con promoting my comic book and the release of Gold Digger Killer at the same time. In 2007, I did not fully understand the industry of comic books. Um, I could have probably told you the difference between Marvel and DC, no doubt, but um, I didn't read a lot of superhero comics. I didn't really read comics that time I was just getting back into reading it I don't think I understood what the formation of a graphic novel was um, I knew uh, sort of what a run was to say I got a four issue run or a six issue run but I didn't really understand it I'm really able to participate now more into that um, area because of Kickstarter you know Kickstarter really revitalized my comic book um, participation and gave me enough of a support base to write something that's 100 pages. And um, I only did that kind of once. My other story that I'm pitching now is The Last Harlemite, and that was a run. That wasn't a long story arc. That was a, it's four issues, and then I'm, I put together into one manga book but it wasn't written as a long story arc. It has a story arc to it, but they're more episodic. You know, the short run, uh, and as, as the character advances, it grows, but it's not one story that needs to be solved and will be solved in the last issue of the story. No, it's more episodic, you know, and the characters grow. So I don't know. That's it for, you know, that's how I... I, I guess that's how I understood the industry, and I learned to get more into it. I read Conan, and Conan didn't necessarily have a, a long story arc. It had it was one issue at a time, one adventure at a time. And I think comics, a lot of comics were like that. You know, creating runs is, is, a, is a 2000s thing, I think. I don't know. Uh oh, your mic went out. I don't know if my mic went out or your mic went out. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? 
Yes. All right. I have a segment on the show, right? Where basically, okay, now I have a segment on the show where you can, where I have this, where you have to put your, you have a comic book, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to put your very best comics. You know, you're putting together a perfect comic book and you have to put the, the, the creator, the, the, the writer, the uh, characters, the inker, all that. So you're putting together your comic book, right? Putting together your book. Who would these people be? And you have to name them all. Like, who would these people be that put together this first, this favorite comic book of that just cool comic book of yours? Oh my God. I mean, I mostly know writers. Um, I would say um, I'm going to use George Jitney, um, who does, uh, who did the Buffy who's now doing The Mandalorian as my illustrator. Of course, I'm going to be the writer. No, sorry, guys. There ain't no competition in that category. Um, <laughs> I really don't have a particular colorist that I like. Um, I don't have an inker that I like. You know, um, I don't know. You know, I'm not able to hire different stages like that. I have a letterer that I use, um, Alex DeLuca. He's out of California. So I would bring him in as a letterer, but, you know, do I have a dream editor? I ain't dreaming that far yet. You know, <laughs> yeah, to be honest, you know, my, you know, what I see, I see Sean um, Hill. I see my man Marcus, who does um, um, Tuskegee Airs. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, Sean Martinberg, I see him. My, mo my boy, Stephen um, 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 Harris, um, dang, who else? Eric, yeah, I can't remember my man name. Eric, he used to do um, L.A. Banks's comic, and he had a comic of his own. So yeah, those are some of the people. But you know, Sean Martinberg and 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 George Gentney, those are two of the dudes that you know I know. You know, if I could afford to work with them. Yo, let's knock it out. They work for, you know, big comic companies, as I, as I know. So I'm down with that. You know what I'm saying? Um, there was a dude that did uh, um, 30 Days a Night. And I liked his style. I liked the guy who does Philadelphia style. I would steal him from, from, um, from Rodney Barnes because I like horror. You know, um, God, I can't think of a man's name. He had a really unique style that did um, 30 Days a Night. And I, I like that style. It really works for horror. And it's very similar to my man that Stephen um, um, Rodney Barnes works with. Sorry, Rodney Barnes works with in Philadelphia. Um, and, I, and I read the comic that he did before he started working with Rodney. And I like him. So... You know, those, yeah, and then a whole bunch of other guys that I wish I could afford, but I don't know a lot of their names. So, okay. I got, I, let me, them. You know, they'd be like, yo, three yeah. times a page. I'm like, <laughs> I can't yeah. work. You know, I'm, I'm barely at $100 a page. Yeah, yeah, that's, to be honest with you, a lot of people price themselves out of, out of a person's pocket because, for one, a lot of people, a lot of people, and I'm going to tell you, a lot of people in this industry, they get a big head about what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? They do, say like, you know, say like, for example, okay, you do something for Marvel. These guys think they did great. Okay. You know, that don't mean you, you're basically messing up your opportunities, you know what I'm saying, to, to get on a, a project. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people overlook projects that's indie a lot of people do that a lot of people overlook them because they don't think that a lot of the indie work or the indie projects are going to make any money you know what i'm saying they're looking at the now they're looking at the oh, i want the now money the fast money the fast marvel money right right but right. then you also got to understand that the fast marvel money ain't going to be there all the time mm. you know what i'm saying and a lot of that money is Basically, you know, you ain't getting paid that much for Marvel anyway. Right. You're getting paid 
You basically getting paid crumbs if if you really look at it. <laughs> they ain't paying you much of what you feel like you're worth. They're not gonna pay you that. Cause so basically even then they trying to get their credit up from mm -hmm. the and then they come back to the cons cons um, commission work to try to get the pay up. Exactly. And what they do basically is like this. Even if did you know that when you take your take your work to Marvel and you work for them now, right? Don't you know that when you take this shit to Marvel or DC or any of these big companies? Well, I don't know if these other big companies, but I know DC and Marvel does this. That when you take it to Marvel, they what they do is they take the rights of your shit, the rights to your project, wow. to your character. You know, and that's why a lot of that's why they that's why when you send it in your portfolio, don't send in your um the work that that's that's like the the real actual work that you send out to people. Don't do that. Send in like the 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 little bit of the stuff that you don't really worry about. You know what I'm saying? Don't just send in your finished work and shit like that. And expect they because they ain't gonna like. They ain't gonna. Uh, they probably take it. I'm I'm telling you. Marvel and DC, half of those characters they got have stole over half of those characters from either each other. DC and Marvel have stole those characters from each other. And notice, did you know that a lot of comic books used to be low price, used to be high, high price, like ten dollars, twenty dollars back then? Wow. They used to be ten dollars, twenty dollars, but Marvel and DC, they basically, you know what I'm saying, ran the market up. And so now it's down to like five dollars, down to ten dollars, down to one dollar, and that's why it conditioned a lot of people to sell their stuff at one dollar, five dollars to make ends meet. But that's not the, that's not how the market was back then. The market was you could actually make a lot of money off of comics back then, rather than now, because Marvel made it fuck the, the whole the whole market up. That's the why. That's why you see it fluctuating, and it's not as successful as you would think. You know what I'm saying? Right. And basically, and also back then in the comic book world, you know what I mean? And in the comic book world, basically, also too that a lot of people you had to know somebody in order to get into the industry. Wow. Too. Feels you like know? That huh? It feels like that now. Yeah, and see, see, but this is the thing: it's it's easier to get into the comic industry right now, but it's not easy to get work, and it's not easy to get the people that you want on it. How I got the people that I wanted on it is by I just built relationships. You know what I'm saying? I built relationships, and I built you know, I helped along the way. You know, I promoted, and I built friendships along the way. You got to usually get the gap. If right. you don't have a gift to gab, you fuck. I'm telling you, you are hit. Like, because if you don't know how to talk to people and get them interested in what you're doing, right? They're gonna bat. They're gonna. They're gonna look at you and be like, "What you got to offer? You ain't got shit to offer." See, and that's how. That, yes, that's how people look at your shit. You got to have confidence with speaking about your shit. You know what I'm saying? And that back, the back end pay ain't gonna always work. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to pay people on the back end is not going to work because people want to get paid for the for the work. People want to get paid for their work, and it's not easy. You know? Yep. Nowadays, times are high. Very high. <laughs> you know, I understand that. That's why I learned to just, you know, get as much as you can and pay the people that you got because you never know. Even I learned to basically get, you know, some people in America can be hard to work with. Some people in overseas can be hard to work with. But if you get somebody overseas that do that does just as much, just as much, um, just as good as somebody from from the United States, and they and their 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 uh their price is low, I would say go for them. But you're basically. Um, some people from overseas, you basically you you may not get it as fast as you would get it from the United States. You know what I mean? But also, people from the United States, some are some are cheap. Hmm. Some are cheap. 
or maximize their profits. Exactly. Some are cheap, but some also can be hard to work with and hard to handle, hard to deal with. You know what I'm saying? But it all it's all how how you handle that. You know what I mean? Not everybody is able to to talk to people and get their best value out. You know what I mean? Yep, I'm a weirdo introvert. I'm learning folks got to know you. And it's important to talk and self-promote. Thank you for the example. For your, yes, you have to be able to promote. You have to be able to go out there and, and put yourself put yourself first. Put yourself first because that's who's going to see you. That The people are going to see you first. They're not going to see your product. They're going to look at you because if you, if they look at they once they look at you and they don't see that confidence in you, they don't see that you are know what you're doing and know know and that love what you do. They're gonna be like, if he don't love what he do, what he does, then I don't want to buy his shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you will get somebody that that'll disrespect you right in front of in front of your face at a table and be like, oh shit, ah, you're trash. You get a troll that'll troll your shit, and that'll be like, oh, you're trash. You're not good enough. You know. They come back, but you're not. He's not. You're not good enough. And some people are are not are not conditioned to handle that at the tables. You know, some people would be with their head down and just be like, oh, you know, and and don't interact with people. That's how when interacting with people, you, that's how you get your sales. That's how you put yourself out there. I'm trying. You see to what find, I'm saying? Trying to find out how to make a comment on the chat. Uh. Um, on somebody, but it didn't let me do it. It kicked me out. Huh. So you know, I saw, I heard you, but I was trying to just. No, no, I understand. I just, that's how Streamyard is. Streamyard. Um, I ain't gonna touch nothing. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it is savage like that. You know, I I understand exactly what you're saying. You you don't have to tell me. I've had mixed experiences with. Of, where they've been, I've had some good experiences with some illustrators and some people, and then no, and I just keep it moving, you know. I try yeah. not to try not to force myself. The things, you know, the illustrators that I've worked with and the creators, they've come to me, you know what I'm saying? And I've I presented them things, and they, you know, yes or no, either they're down with it or they're not. We ain't, if you you, know, you can't do it, you can't do it. Right. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you uh, something about some some uh, people that have come up to you trying to get work from you. Some people will try to come up and get work from you, but they won't. Uh, they'll try to steal your shit. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot of them in this industry. They'll try to steal your stuff and act like they're going to do the work for you. Act like they're going to um, and you pay them. They'll take the money and run and don't do shit. They'll I've, take your shit, too. I've had. I've had um, illustrators, you know, kind of not necessarily burn me. I've knock on wood. I've never got my money taken where I didn't get what I paid for. Um, and thanks to like kicks, um, uh, what is it, PayPal and Cash App, I pay by pay, I pay by page. The most you're going right. to get from me is you know whatever I'm paying you per page. I'm you right. know, and and I'll I'll put a. a uh, I'll pay you on the um the the the, uh, the, the sketch, and I'll pay I'll pay half a page. Mm -hmm. I don't have, I'm not paying 100 percent up front. You kidding me? Yeah, You've got a history. You know if, if you know these characters behind me are all commissioned work, so right. no new dude. You know what I'm saying? So I pay by page, and and I do small projects. I'll start with a pinup. I'll do a right. short story. And if you work and we can work together, you can trust me. I'm because there's illustrators that have been burnt too. I get it. You know what I'm saying? Right. Illustrators that have said, yo, I did five pages for this guy and they haven't paid me yet. I know the feeling. But mm -hmm. I've got years in this industry to show that I'm not that guy. So at the end of the day, we're going to work together, but I'm not paying you five pages in, in advance. We're going to feel each other out. Yeah, that's see, and that's the thing, you know, my time coming into this industry as a, as a young buck, you know what I'm saying? Um, it was hard because not, uh, I'm going to tell you something about this industry. It's packaged. 
And what I mean by that is, is like clicks. They clickish. A lot of them clickish, and a lot of them rolling clicks. What I mean by that, if you're not doing what somebody tell, so you're not doing what they want you to do, they won't fuck with you. You know what I'm saying? For example, okay. People like a lot of black folks looked at Jarhead as, oh, he's not black. He don't have black skin. So I'm going to say fuck him and stop talking to me because Jarhead wasn't black. And Jarhead is black. He's just light skin. That's it. He's just a light skin motherfucker. He's, he's Indian, black, uh, Russian, and um, Ru Indian, black, and Russian. I forgot, I forgot the other shit. It's been a long time since I created him. You know, but in Italian. So if you really look at that, all of those, all of those, um, all of those cultures have black within them, but not a lot of people know that. Right. And how's what the, people don't. Uh, how's the character? Behave? How does the character what? Behave. How does he act? Is he is he a hero for black people, or is he just a black person living through life? He fights for fight for fight the good fight. He fights for what's, what's right. You know what I'm saying? And he fights for everybody. I'm gonna tell you right now. I'm out for what's right. You know, it's like yeah. we need health care, but we also need to end racism. In which exactly story? is your story ending racism or is it fighting yeah. for health care? You know, is there? A, you know, I got you. You know, the, one of the things that you know we always deal with the black heroes is yo. This character is he saving the world or is he saving black people? There's two different things, and both are righteous. But what makes you right. a black hero is you address the problems that black people have. You know, Captain America wasn't confused. He fought Nazis. Nazis wasn't a threat to the world. Nazis wasn't a threat to the world. Nazis was dealing with. Age, um, um, uh, Jewish people and Africans. That was it. He was white supremacy, but he wasn't a threat to the whole world. He probably wasn't, you know, Captain America wasn't like, oh, there's a comet, there's an alien invasion. He wasn't worried about that. He was dealing with something very political. And, you know, some black characters and some black heroes, they're not concerned with the issues of black people right now. And that's fine. Not all of my characters deal with the issue of black people, but you got to understand that. Right. And that's why I tell people, you know, like Jarhead, Jarhead is, is this character that, that deals with spirituality, you know what I'm saying? More than the physical. And he deals with PTSD. He deals with, you know what I'm saying? If you, if, if people, if y'all watching and y'all been to the military, y'all served in the military, you would understand with all that, all that, all the bombs going on, and you see people getting killed and stuff like that, mutilation overseas and everything, people will understand PTSD with that situation. You know what I'm saying? That's a real issue, no, no doubt. It's a and, It's a mainstream. Yeah. I mean, unless, yeah. you know, unless you're dealing with it as a black person, because in the military, yeah, you got PTSD, but then you come home and you're dealing with healthcare. And the healthcare yeah. is impacted by racism. So yeah, I'm I'm with all the PTSD, but in reality, you know, it also America sub subdivides a lot of issues based on race. So when you mm -hmm. talk about vets, they still realize even amidst their enrollment and and you know in the military that there is a difference based on race. So yeah, I get it. So I don't know. I've never read the comic book. So I would, you know, love to see how you deal with those issues. I mean, he sounds like a complex character because he sounds almost like Tiger Woods. He's a little bit of everybody, you know. Yeah. It would, it would be how does he identify with himself? Does he get, does he get pulled over by the police or is he <laughs> I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't know the, the his true identity until he meets God. He, until he meets God, he know he learns his purpose. Does you know what I'm saying? What you say? Does he have a physical form? Yep, he has a physical form. And he has an angelic form. He's an angel mixed with the human. So, does this person that has a physical form would he be a victim of racism? Yes, he will. So then he would know that. Mm-hmm.
spiritual being, but I know that I'm a spiritual being having a, uh, having a spiritual experience and as a black person right now. He was in Russia, like it's, it's a part. It's a part in in the story that I did that I that I'm working on putting in. You know, part three, part three of Jarhead is um where he goes to Russia from being um the station. He goes to Russia from his families to his grandma and grandfather. His grandma is Indian, and his fa his grandfather is Russian. His mom is Italian. His dad is black. Okay. You see what I'm saying? You know what I mean? So a lot of that comes, a lot of that, you know what I'm saying, is 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 joined into that. And the they picked on, it takes place in um in Oakland, California. You know what I mean? And then he and goes it, his parents gets killed. His parents gets killed by his uncle, Long Law's uncle, his father's best friend. And his it gets killed and everything, and he sees the the gruesome killing, uh, the gruesome scene of his parents dead, right? And he's shown that, and that's how he got PTSD. And then he goes into the military from over from being in Russia and everything. So he knows the Russian Federation, and he knows the uh, the U.S. military. So he gets so, killed in America. Right? What you say? His father gets killed in America. Yep. Okay. And then he goes out and to Russia to avenge the death of his father. And his basically as a child he gets sent over he gets sent over as a child to live with his parent grandparents now. So now he's basically How old you know his father got killed. Well, Deech, thanks for the hold on, hold on. Thanks for the introduction to Mr. Jeff. I look forward yeah. to communicating with you, and I can join the pen personal email. That way, you can reach out to me. She she uh, told me to send you the uh, the thing. Uh, well, she she wants you to inbox her, Miss uh, Renee. And and also, you put my links in the description of the video. So yeah, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Renee Let me send them there. Information on the description of this YouTube video, so it's in there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm about to do that right now to again, just in case um, people do, forgot about it. Hold on, where is it? At? Okay, there you go. All his links is in the description, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, like, what I was saying is, is that he go, he gets sent over to Russia and everything, and he gets picked on because of his skin because he's darker than a lot of people over there. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? He's darker than a lot of people over there, and and a lot of people from Russia think that Americans is dumb and stupid. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And and people don't understand that over in Russia they're racist okay. and everything. And his grandfather, who was Russian, his grandfather who was Russian was a little bit darker, a little bit darker. He said, "I go through this. I go through it too, sir, son." You know what I'm saying? And so he showed him how to fight. And he basically, you know, got into the military and military and everything. And that's how he came back to America to become part of the military. So he learned how to fight over in Russia. Mm hmm And by his grandfather, who was Russian? Mm hmm Okay. And he didn't have a problem with him because he had a black father. He accepted him. And then he came back to America to join the military, and, mm -hmm. and but he had PTSD from his, seeing his father get killed as a young person. Mm -hmm. So he went into the military with some PTSD. Mm. Yeah, and, and learn how to learn how to deal with it. But it got worse from seeing others people dying and everything. And that's how he it, 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 the way the story is going to be told. The way the story is going to be told is going to be very loop. It's going to have a lot of whole, a lot of loopholes where I'm going to put more stuff into it. You is, know what I'm saying? Is this your first story that you writ, wrote? Yep. Right. So it's a virgin story. I mean, uh, have you taken any writing classes on story writing? Nope. Just I, I do this from the from the heart. You know what I mean? So everybody does from the heart, son. Don't think. That <laughs> 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 
<laughs> no, 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 no. I was talking about like I took it from the heart because that's something that you know I, I didn't I didn't have to take writing classes to do it. I just it just come from so you know so natural. You self taught, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, natural. What I would say to you is, in addition to being self taught, which we all like, how I got into writing. My cousin and I used to go see the movies on 42nd Street. And when I lived in New Jersey, my friends couldn't hang out. We couldn't hang out on 42nd Street. I'm from Street. Jersey. Right. I'm from Teaneck, New Jersey, right? So, I'm from Camden. <laughs> don't feel, son. Don't, you know. So, um, taking the bus in from Jersey was different than catching the train where you could almost hop the train in New York and be downtown in minutes. Jersey was different. You had to get on the bus. And buses didn't always let young kids get on the bus like you could get on the train in New York. You know? Mm -hmm. Get on the train. And it was even, wasn't even as dangerous. So in middle school, we used to ride the train down to 42nd Street, see movies, and then come back. And I would tell my friends in Jersey what I saw. And of course, it was like, oh, you ain't seen nothing. This is corny. So I had to make the movie sound good. So that was my embellishment right there taught me. And they would say, well, what was the movie about? How did it end? And I learned that storytelling is just a series of answering questions. You know, right. the same thing that I'm telling you, I'm asking you about your story. Those are the things that a reader would want to know. Mm -hmm. As I teach English, right? I do mm -hmm. my workshop, so I teach 12th grade English. A lot of these kids have stories they want to tell. So for me, what I do is tell writers, yo, take a writing class. There might be some master classes, some free stuff online. You just encouraged me to even put some of the stuff that I do for free up online because it saves you time and for me as a reader it gets you to pass your first dummy story mm -hmm. and wasting money my first comic book is just as good as a little bit you know just as good as readable as mm -hmm. good as that i have now but that's because my comic books weren't my first time writing mm -hmm. you know? yeah and, and when I wrote my first movie, I didn't go in and on it saying, yo, I want you to, I can tell a good story. I got a director who was a writer. I sent them my script idea and they, they tweaked it, right? They gave me the second draft. And that's, yeah, I, mean, I even gave them writing credit on my first one. My second one, now I had an idea of what it was like to write. And I wrote my second movie, Gold Digger Killer, all myself. And that was that. But I had taken a couple of writing classes. Even before that, I had gone to a black film festival. Every black film festival except for the first one. I used to fly out to Acapulco and go to the black film festival out there. So what I'm saying to you is, sure, I like your idea. And I'm asking questions on it because I'm interested. But... Mm -hmm. you know, it's definitely PTSD is a form of mental illness, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And we're dealing with mental health of black men right now. So there's definitely something with that. But I think mm -hmm. his complicated racial history makes him capable of not being embraced by any community. But as a writer, you're a black man. I don't know your racial makeup. You know what I'm saying? But you don't mm -hmm. me, Jeff. I'm Italian, I'm Russian, I'm Indian. And you just say, yo, check me out. I want to have you on the show. So I go by what I see. I see a black course, man, course. right? So I see yeah. a black man. But I, I'm just, the love that I would give your comic is because of you, not necessarily because your character. Because I don't know if your character would be viewed the same as I see you. No, 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 no. Yeah, I understand very much. So, That's why I try to tell people, you know, don't focus on the character. Focus on the person that I am, because at least I'm not buying you. I'm not reading you. I'm yeah, just, that's what I'm saying. I'm reading your character, like for me, um, that's one of the things that I had to separate. When you're talking to people in the industry of comic books, 
They want to hear the character. They will get to know you through how you write the character. Right, right, right. You understand? Your character mm -hmm. is now a representative of you. So all of that, you know, you're saying, you know, worry about the character, worry about, no, it's the other way around. You understand? Until you develop a writing identity through a body of work, everybody will know you first. That's the guy that wrote such and such. I like such and such. They don't know you. They know your character. And make right, sure right. that character, of course, you might not like him. You might not think he needs to be likable, but it is important because that's all they're worried about is your character. And I say that because now you see me sitting in front of my wallpaper of characters. All of these are my, and these are just the comic book characters. My films have characters. And my right. Characters. And, and people, they, you know, oh, read this book. Well, who is it about? What is happening to that character? You understand what I'm saying? Same thing with my movies. They may be different characters in the movies, but at the mm -hmm. end of the day, those are who it's about. And what happens to the characters and what type of scenarios the characters are placed in are, are a reflection of me. Right, 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 right. You know, so yeah, it is going to be about your characters, bro. Don't get upset because you create your characters. No, no, no. See, the thing about me is that, you know, when I created Jarhead, I created him for everybody. You know what I'm saying? And I knew that everybody wasn't going to like him. I knew that everybody wasn't going to accept him. So that's why I took it for face value and just kept going. I'll say this to you. I, I had, when I first got into comic book writing, and, and selling, which is different than film, because when you do film, you don't always see the people that see it. When you sell books, sometimes you don't always go to book fairs, right? But mm -hmm. conventions are where people go to get comics, specifically indie ones. So I had to say, yo, dude, you got black characters. Who are you selling your characters to? Everybody, right? Number one, everybody. Because it ain't about, um, oh, it's a black character. My character can't be everybody. But everybody that likes horror will like my character. Everybody that likes gargoyles will like my character. Everybody that likes adventure. So there are the access points to everybody. You don't, the character don't have to be everybody for everybody to like the character. I'm not nowhere near Luke Starwalker, but I like him because I like the universe and the values that he's placed in. He's a character in Star Wars universe. And because I understand what he's got to go through, I'm watching this white dude. White people like black characters. Shoot, you go to the Midwest, they tearing up hip hop music. And ain't no apologetic, ain't no hip hop or rapper ever said, yo, I'm black, Italian, Asian, Indian. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm black from the blackest hood. And right. Then, but that's that, but you know, see, that's the thing. Mine is universal. I'm I'm I, I tell you what, I tell you what. The thing about my character is I don't I don't wear I don't just put them one cultural because I know about a lot of cultures and I wanted to make them multicultural and a lot of things. I knew that a lot of people wasn't going to like it and I wasn't worried about them. I just said, you know, because at the end of the day, I know my character is going to be liked by most, most, most people, but if it's not going to be liked by everybody, then Hey, that's kind of what's fine with me. I'm cool. You know what I'm saying? Because I know, I know I'm great at what I do. Yeah. You know, I'm, I know I'm still learning, but at the end of the day, you know what I'm saying, as a man and as a as a person, you know what I'm saying, because of jar because of my character Jarhead, I've learned a lot of good things. I've learned a lot of um a lot of things that I that I needed to learn and I learned a lot of patience with people, you know what I'm saying? But I also understood that because Jarhead is lighter lighter skinned and because I'm darker skinned a lot of people is not going to buy them. But Ben's though, that doesn't, make head is, that doesn't make any sense at all. I like well, white. Well, it makes sense to me. I mean. Listen, listen. I like white characters. For you to say because he's light-skinned, I wouldn't like him, makes no sense to me. 
But not everybody thinks like you or me, bro. Not everybody thinks like you or me. But why wouldn't they like it? Is there I guess I guess because some people are prejudiced, some people are not. I don't know, bro. I don't know where that exists. I don't know where you're selling comics that somebody picks well, look. it up. It's, it's, it's well, look. I think here's the thing. Here's the thing. I can tell you that maybe people are not into Jarhead and who the character is, but I don't think it's because he's light-skinned. You understand? And here's the other thing. You know other cultures. I know other cultures. That doesn't stop me from knowing cultures and being respectful and into other cultures because I'm one culture. You understand? I get, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But I'm, I'm at a, at a, at a, as a person, I learned to basically... If I get a, a person that don't that don't buy it, they don't buy it. But I'm not going to sit there and change what I'm doing because they didn't like it. Every, it's like it's like saying that's like saying okay, one person don't like uh, Wolverine the way he the way he, his color his color okay, but another person is going to like him because of his color. Not everybody's going to like him. Not everybody's going to like him. I think color is a is is a real. A factor, right? I but, feel you. But comic books transcend that. I don't know anybody that's ever said Storm is not dark enough for me to like. I don't know anybody that said. Well, oh, I mean, if they exist, I don't know how big that audience is of people. And I would challenge you to produce data that 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 um su supports that particular claim and i'm not saying you're wrong i'm saying i in my 20 years of being in the comic book industry and more of that being in entertainment right because i got out of college in 1990. right I, you, but, see what you just said okay i'm sorry about that, sorry about that. i know racism exists right and I know it exists in the real world but I've never heard of anybody bringing that level in a significant amount. Not saying it doesn't exist, but it's still like 90% of the people you will still reach without worrying about the complexion of your character. Right, but that, that's why I was saying it wasn't bothering me because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the reason why I brought it up was because to stir, to help the, the conversation even better. You know what I'm saying? And two, bro, for the simple fact, when when I brought Jarhead out, I was like, okay, you know what I'm saying? You know, you, you're going to be liked by, you know, the black people, black folks. You know, I'm black. You know, we are black, you know. And I saw all black, all these black characters, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, yo, so you're going to be, we're going to do some work together, right? So, you know, I'm telling you about the situation, you know, and they all stood, stood off of me, stood away from me. And, you know, what I'm saying I'm like, damn, standoffish and shit like that. So I'm like, OK. And that's that's what see me as a person like they be like. So you and it's a lot of people that I know that is black, just like me, make white characters. And a story from a black man's point of view. Right. That but has a go ahead. I'm listening. You cut out a minute. No, no. Uh, what I was saying is like I'm I'm telling it from a black man's point of view than just you know what I'm saying from a if a white you see okay, a white man can't tell a black man's story, can he? It depends. He's telling what he observes as a black person doing, but he's not black. It's the same thing as I, when I write my white characters or when I write female characters. I have female characters, yet yeah. Are they written the way a female would write them? Probably not, but there are of a way a man would observe a female, and that's me. So Right, that's what I'm saying. That's a lot of a lot of it is well how I wrote Jarhead, it was different for me because I know a lot about those those cultures because I paid attention to them and I was around a lot of people that was Italian. I was around a lot of people that were, that were Russian. I I, I just studied a lot of the stuff that I did that I that I learned from these people. And half my my grandma, my great grandma is is 
Indian, a little bit of Indian, right? And so I'm like, okay, and I'm black. So I'm like, okay, let me put a little black spin onto it. Let me put a little Indian spin onto it. Let me put a little of this. And that's what you got, you know, and everybody and all those cultures have black within them. So why not put that in there? You know what I'm saying? And hey, it's cool. You know, I I wasn't worried about it. I was feeling good. (laughs) I don't think there's anything like, for instance, with me, my last name is Carol, right? I Mm -hmm. went to convention. In, in England, and I met somebody that said, oh, I'm from the Carroll family, right? And we have mm-hmm. a fest, we're Irish, and we have a beer festival every year. We'd love for you to come out to it. What do you think I felt? How did you feel? Did, I'm asking, what do you think I felt? Did I feel happy? Was I, oh, shoot, let's do it. Did you feel well, guess, left out? Guess how you think I felt. You felt basically left out in a way, kind of like awkward. Not necessarily. How do you think I got Irish in my family? Ancestors. Was it jungle fever? Could have been. My last name is Carol. They own my ancestors on a plantation. Yeah. It was not love. Okay. Okay. So my European ancestry is not a desired portion of my makeup. You understand? Right. So I ain't got time for that. You want to pay me reparations? These people are the rapers of my family from my ancestors. It ain't cool. Do I run around hating everybody? No, I'm perfectly fine with it, but I know my situation. Now, uh-huh. then had some fun, sure, but I have a lot of other elements of my ancestry that I would rather connect with, rather go to Africa. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Right, so right, right. I, I have no problem eating pizza or anything Italian, but I was or Irish beer. I do. I go hang out on St. Patrick's Day, but I didn't want to be reminded of it because I think there is a real element of 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 um, reconciliation that needs to be taking place. You know, I'm not of just forgive and forget. If I want to forgive you, then you also have to be apologetic. Neither one of us are the actual perpetrators of the crime. You ain't rape me, you understand? Know but you mm-hmm. know, did play a role in that. So I think that's a little bit of what you might be dealing with. I mean, I'm just trying to do it real quick because I know, you know, um, that's not necessarily the subject of what we was talking about. No, no, you good, you good, you good. But I think when you look into that in terms of the understanding, and I don't even know who you're talking about, right? In terms of the standoffishness, um, I think maybe it's not what you think it is. I think a, maybe it is just that you haven't come finished doing the character yet. And people don't fully understand. I know when you introduced it to me, I had a lot of questions. I don't know a character like yours. And you're pioneering a new type of character, a caring Tiger Woods. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I mean John James. No. Go ahead, go ahead. Tiger Woods, is, would your character support reparations? Yeah, it's on. I'm working on it. <laughs> working on a lot of stuff with it. If he does. That's a unique type of character. You understand know what I'm saying? Because these cultures are not at friendliness. Mm-hmm. Reconciled. You live in a country where you have cultures at war. They actually consider white people that are cool with black people liberals. They don't just call them regular. Because it's not a normal behavior for them to be cool. It's not normal for them to hate us either, but they got the right wing. There's very few that it's like in the middle. So it's, I think that's what you're dealing with, is that your character may not, who knows how your character fits into those dynamics. Because we are multicultural. We love Chinese food. We love our Italian food. We have the conversation with, with their cultures. Heck, you got 24 cultures in Europe or something, 72 in Africa. We be finding ourselves more concerned with the 24 cultures in Europe than we are with Africa. You could have said, Jeff, he's Nigerian, he's Angolan, he's South African, he's also Spain, he's also this. But you, you know, your character is probably more oppressor than he is of itself. And then he's just black. 
That's a nothing. I'm black. Well, Harriet Tubman called herself Ashanti. She found out her tribe. She found out the language that her culture spoke. You understand what I'm saying? So, like, I have a character called Thug Angel. He's an immortal. He lived from Egypt. He lived from before there was an America, before there was a Nigeria, before there was a Russia. He's older than those places. We're older than Ireland, older than England, right? Because none of those go back before AD, you know? If you go back to AD, you're dealing with Rome, which started later than that, and Greece, which is a little bit before AD. But we're, my character is 5,000 years old. He was born in 3000 BC. So how does he interact with people? He's cool. He understands the cultures. He oversees them because he remembers when they was around. His dude married a girl, that, a witch that was hunted by the, um, the, the, the King James and the witch hunts in England. You understand what I'm saying? So I mm -hmm. put those demographics in it. But when they come to America, they clear about who they are. You understand? Know they don't necessarily deal with racism per se, but that's why I tell people he's a black dude. You, know, you like him. Whether you're Italian, whether you're Arab, whether you're Chinese, or you're black. And they mm -hmm. like it. You understand? So I understand that you're creating this new character. I think you should finish creating them, him and then let then give it to people and see what they think. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I plan on um, doing some more stuff to him, uh, tweet, uh, doing a lot of, um, a lot of uh, more spinoff stories with them just to basically bring in his backstory more, his origin more, you okay. know what I'm saying? Yeah, because I, but like, that's why I said from book one, book one will basically, book, book one is a book of full of questions, you know what I'm saying? So book two will be a way to answer, answer all of those. Because it's written as a mystery, almost like a Jason yeah. Bourne? Basically, it's written as basically like, okay, uh, what happened? Who saved Jarhead from being captured? And who saved the, the, like that? You know what I'm saying? How did he get out of the how, how did he get out of uh, get out of the church when he got shot by <laughs> by the people that was chasing after him? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, many times I don't even care what the character um, is. Uh, kind of micro ethnicities, right? I just go by, mm -hmm. you know, he looks um, he looks cool. I got a black creator. You know, I got black creators of white, right, white characters. I support them too. Right now, there's so many black creators out here that I can't even support everybody. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes I do it the way I, it's a, it's, it's a luxury. It's like black movies. They used mm -hmm. to be, you had to support every black movie that came out. Now, we had 15 come out in theaters right before the quarantine, you know, so now you can say, I don't really like that genre. I don't really like Tiger, uh, Taylor, Tyler Perry. I don't really like uh, uh, 50 Cent. So you can pick and choose. Right. But um, so I don't know. I would, I would um, be interested in, you know, you could tell me off camera who some of these creators are um, that you feel, but I'm open to it. I haven't seen it, so I'm open to it. You know, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I because see, to be honest, to be honest with you, you know, these characters, this was earlier on in my career, earlier on, and when I did it, you know, what I'm saying, um, I've gotten a lot of good feedback from it, you know, what I'm saying, because of what I did to them, because of how I developed, developed them, you know, what I'm saying, and um. What I'm gonna do? I'm coming out with a, a book, a small booklet, a small book called "The Collision of the Colossus." The Collision of the Colossus is basically a, a small action book, where it's going to be taken out of book two to basically, it's going to be like a scene for nothing but action. It's a scene in book two where Jarhead is chasing the villain to kill him, right? And chasing the villain, but he runs into this cloning lab of. Uh, called the, is running into the cloning lab and he sees his friend in his uh, septic tank, like a tank for cloning. And he's in the tank and he's uh, he's in there and he's looking at him. And all of a sudden he, uh, the, the uh, villain hits the button and he says, activate Smash X. 
activate Operation Smash X. And that's when the action, the story of Collision of the Colossus started, starts. And so this story, you, you um, felt that there were some black people that didn't like your character because of that, or they didn't like you? I guess they didn't like me, or they didn't like, the, so they didn't buy the character, and they didn't, it was like, fuck him, I, you know, such and such. He ain't doing what we doing, so I won't give a fuck. But I was like, you know. Did they say that specifically? The, from, I was going off of, off of their energy and the way they was acting towards me, you know what I'm saying? And, um, yes, yeah, so I was going you, off. What did you want them to do beyond buy it? What, did, what were you asking for them to do? At the time, at the time, me as a person, I was going through a lot of acceptance situations where I wanted to be accepted by my peers and everything. So you wanted to oh, this is this is dope. Yeah, yeah, I wanted them to say, this is dope, uh, bro. you know what I'm saying? Buy this shit, buy it because, you know, hey, it's, it's a character. And I thought they was going to like it because of the situation, was, uh, which I was, you know, I was like, man, this is a character, I put a lot of hard work into it. And I seen a lot of other characters that looked at just like mine, got a lot of um, acceptance that, that was accepted by everybody. But at the time, it was they didn't accept mine. So I was like, okay, you know. Where was this? This was, I say, because I've been in the industry 17 years. Was it in Camden? Um, no, this wasn't in Camden. No, 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 no. This, this is over the internet, over the internet. You know what I'm saying? This wasn't. Okay, okay. And, and these guys were established? No, nah, these was like, you know, I don't even know if they're in the business anymore. Well, there were new guys at the time? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll say this. Like, I remember being in a writer's group. And mm -hmm. when I went to the writer's group, I felt a pushback because mm -hmm. I came in. Now, mind you, I'm in a writer's group, but I had already had an award-winning movie. You know, I didn't write my first novel until three years after Gold Digger Killer came out. Mm -hmm. So... I'm writing this. I want to write this character. I never wrote a book before, you know, mm -hmm. uh, an original story for a book. And I, I met with this writer's group, and it was, you know, really different type of feedback. You know, I'm um, telling them about Thug Angel. He's a gargoyle. He's this and that. You know, um, he fights vampires. It, it, there's nothing in it that says, you know, he's killing white people, right? But mm -hmm. they were very concerned with where it was going. Nobody's going to buy a story about a black werewolf killer. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to do this, right? At the time, this was 2010. Very much so. There weren't any black people on covers of a lot of these books. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, they, you know, they might have been speaking to the time, but, and this was before we kind of con concerned ourselves with black sci fi. And um, I hadn't gone to a, fair, a book fair or anything to even see what it was like. So, I left the group. It was about a 45 minute ride. I used to go like every other week, maybe once or twice a month. And we would, we would create. And sometimes we wouldn't leave until like 12 or 1 o'clock, right? Or that's what mm -hmm. time I would get. And um, so it was a demanding thing. And I think I may have went up there about five, about five times, right? Mm -hmm. And then I stopped going. I later realized that after talking to somebody else that went, that the people that were coordinating it were working together on their own project. And mm -hmm. they know how to get their project done so they were overthinking themselves and then here comes me and other people with simple projects that we're making progress on so mm -hmm. i was running too fast for them and i was doing my own thing and that was a problem for them so it was more of a competition thing and of course we Good don't anything. Right. We also had ideological differences, but that's not that big of a deal. 
what it was was that uh, the the competition gave them the fuel to speak on the ideological differences. Because you ever know mm-hmm. somebody that don't like you and they want to find something negative to say about you? Mm-hmm. They only that they might be right, right? That might be something that you need to change, but they really don't like you, and that's the reason why they're telling you. So when you say. Oh, black people might not like you. I'm like, all right, I'm black, but you can't let that first experience of black people frame your experiences with black people. You understand? Right, right, right. That's why when when I that's why when I was putting it out, you know what I'm saying, a lot of people my color was like, damn, I like that. I like Dread. I like his character. I like the way he is. You know what I mean? So that's why. You might have been too close. I mean, to be honest, black on black crime is not a thing because every ethnicity kills each other more than they kill people outside of their ethnicity. White people kill white people more than anybody else. Black people kill black people more. Than... Asians kill and violent do violent things to other Asians in America more than anybody else. So the reason why is because we interact with people of our own ethnicity. We feel very similar, so we may compete and 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 um, get frustrated with each other more. So that's just natural. So because you were black, you felt you felt uh, feedback that you probably would have never got from a white person because they don't feel competitive with you because you ain't white. Right, right, right. That's why I was like, but you I was telling. You- I'm not going to talk to you the same way I would talk to a white guy because I might not understand it. I may talk to you as a creator. Yeah. Right. My story. I can do that, but I can't help you negotiate white people. If you're white, I might sit back and just be listening. But because you're black and you said something about black people, I'll try. I might be right. I might be wrong. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, a lot of things I learned in this business, you got to be more diverse you got to be very diverse and you got to keep your you have to be able to be able to talk to everybody because not everybody you know what i'm saying you have to be able to talk you have to be able to know how to talk here's, a, here's another thing i'll say to you about um diversity and everybodyness right um i'm from the 90s and the 80s when we had affirmative action right and mm-hmm. we, we were using the term diversity And diversity meant put an Asian in the room, put a Latina in the room, put a black person in the room, in the room with white people. Your company needs to be reflective of the United States. Then as it went on, diversity started to shift. You need to have a tall person in the room with a short person. You need to have smokers in the room with non-smokers. And we were like, what the hell are you talking about? We were talking about diversity because people were being denied opportunities because of the way they look. You're up here talking people that live on campus versus people that commute. Ain't nobody being oppressed because they don't live on campus. You know what I'm saying? So at some point, diversity got off target. What I mean about catering to people, at some point, you need to just do you and, and, and do find your audience and cater to your audience. But don't try to cater too much because you go too far, it doesn't feel official. It feels like appropriation or pandering, mm-hmm. you know? So yeah. stay, true, stay true to you are and, and pull people to you. Like Prince didn't make black music for black people. He made black music. When he's singing about Dove's Cry, yeah, that's a mixed family. But he's going through a hardship. And then mm-hmm. the world responded. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, and he didn't change his music. He didn't say, yo, they don't like bass guitar. I'm putting my bass guitar in it. You know what I'm saying? Right. I, the blues. Boom, right. boom, boom. You know what I'm saying? He didn't take mm-hmm. his, he didn't say, oh, let me play the music that they listen to. He said, let me play my music and get them to listen to it. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I evolved him even in a, in a way where he's, where he, like, oh my God, they can't do nothing but re- they can't do nothing but see him now. You know what I'm saying? And for the simple fact, you know, um, he has a character that's he ha- he he's a character that that will 
that reaches out to everybody, but not everybody's going to accept them. But you got to understand, not every, you have to have the mindset of look, when you're doing this character, you have to have people in mind, your readers in mind. What are they going to think? How are they going to feel? You know what I mean? Um, and that's what I was thinking, you know. And I've been in there 17 years, man, and it's, it feels like like I got into this business. Um, it feels like I've been in this business longer, but it's been 17 years. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I've been doing journey for 17 years because I put it down. I put, I put like, I was writing it for like 12, but you know, I started doing it for the other half of the, of the 17, you know what I'm saying? Man, and so I started straight as well. Yeah, I'm a writer, and I do all my character designs. And then you hire um, other um, illustrators to sequential pages? Yeah, sequentials, and I hire my artists to, um, to like, if I care for character, I have them redraw it out and everything, and uh, what he'll do is ink it or whatever, and I have I send, I send him and tell him to do the sequentials and tell them about the st character and all that stuff. And I have a whole team help me, helping me put this together. Well, that is beautiful, man. I tell you, so it's nice. I'm glad you hooked up. I don't know if I reached out to you or you saw me, but um, it was a pleasure to know you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Touch, touch uh, yeah. With you, or to get in your face, son. <laughs> you know it. I'm not <laughs> son, so. Yeah. And you know what's crazy too, you know, um, I tell a lot of people, this show is all about all about bringing the, the, the little man on to build the little man and his brand on because not because like I said, I'm here to help everybody. I'm here to build everybody up and build them up as up as well as myself. And like I said, if you if you know anybody, any any more creators, any more writers, bring them my way. I bang it like easy, get it out of the way. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, very much, I guess, for having me. I see we don't went over the five o'clock mark, but um, please hit me back. Um, you know, if, uh, if we got some more questions, maybe we could delve into some of the subgenres. I love to talk about cyber funk. I love to mm -hmm. talk about Afrofuturism, um, mm -hmm. even horror, because my movies are horror. So okay. maybe, you know, we can set up something else where I can come and talk about some of those things specifically. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll, I'll hit you up, and I'll hit you up once you get off and set that up. Okay, thank you very yeah. much, bro. I appreciate Not a problem. I wish you good luck, everybody. You know, Catherine, other people that's in the chat, uh, Robin, all those people. My contact information is in the description. Um, you can get me Jeff Carroll. I'm on Coach Yo Jeff Instagram. I have the Sci-Fi Express Lane on YouTube. Um, I'm Jeff Carroll on Amazon if you want to check out any of my books. My company is called Hip Hop Comics and Flicks. So you can check me out. I have a blog page. And um, that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know what's crazy, too? I would like to, I would like to, you know, um, if you would like to be, I mean, participate in any other, you know, spots, any other uh, segments that we have, we have a segment called the the roundtable discussion where with the crew and me and we talk about all kinds of stuff you know it's a it's a uh fluctuating door so it's an in and out door so it'll be some people different nowadays now so uh where we would like to if you are interested in joining the join the crew and getting to know the crew and talking to talking you know what i'm saying we talk about any and everything on those on those shows right. so well send me the send me the date time and if i can um uh, connected with my schedule, I'm there. Not a problem, not a problem. I got you, I got you. Let me know. Uh, let me take us out of here. Thank y'all for watching. It's been well. And also, I need y'all to like, subscribe, and hit that notifications bell to get everything that is the In Your Face show. And we out of here. Peace. <laughs>